thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. Look, we're going back to the basics. This is we're going to go through like the comprehensive guide to what a screening visit should be at a clinical research site. I'm literally going through one of my e-source. So we use Creo for e-source. I'm going through one of my e-source for a moderately complicated study. It's actually relatively complicated and it's a good one to use for this topic because I want to show you like even for the complicated studies what a screening visit is like before we start and actually before any screening visit you need I need to stay caffeinated I need energy so shout out to my latest sponsor Life Boost Coffee it's the first time I've spo I've had any sponsor that's nothing to do with clinical research Life Boost Coffee. My affiliate link is underneath. What I like about this one is the bifidobacterium that it has. This is cold brew that's actually good for you and it increases your bifidobacterium, which those of you that know, I've been interviewing with Dr. Hazen. This is not her product, but I've been interviewing with her for years and she kept telling me bifidobacterium is the way to go. This coffee actually has it. It was like serendipitous. I even found them. It was through the Dr. Joe show. I have with one of my sub investigators. So Life Boost Coffee, check it out. Okay, screening visit. Really a successful screening visit starts before you actually do the visit. It starts pre-screening the patient. And we should really do like a separate video on pre-screening, which we will. But this is assuming that you did a good job pre-screening the patient. This is assuming you did a good job reminding the patient to come in. Um, what goes on at the screening visit. So the first thing you got to make sure is that the patient actually shows up. Believe it or not, we're supposed to be having right now a screening visit at my site, Yuma Clinical Trials. Guess what? The coordinator just texted me the patient is not showing up and he's not answering the phone. So that happens. And you, you could be prepared as you want the day before but if your patient's not there, there's nothing going on. So make sure you get the patient there. Now, provided you have the patient there, you got to start considering how are you going to get the medical history? Is it a patient that's part of your clinic? Um, in that case, that's great. What do your SOPs say about getting records from patients part of your clinic? If you're at a clinic where the research is the same company as the medical clinic, I assume you're fine, but never assume. Always ask leadership, management, what they think. This is not advice, by the way, like not legal advice when it comes to HIPAA. This is just how I do it. At my site, Yuma Clinical Trials, we are embedded into a private practice. It's called Up to Par. Those are two separate companies but we exist synergistically in the same, same company. Our PI is the owner of both. But because they are separate companies, even when they are patients from the practice, we have in our SOP that it allows us to do that because we received training from the clinic uh, on HIPAA training and things like that. But if that's not the case for you, make sure you do that. So getting the records is the first thing. Now, if they're, if they're not a patient from your clinic, what you need to do is you need to get the patient to sign an authorization to release medical records. Now, normally, this authorization to release medical records, like ideally you'll get this from the patient before you even do the screening. But in many cases, it's not possible to obtain until the screening date. So this authorization to release medical records this is something that you, you have to obtain. You have to get the signature from the patient stating, I, I allow Yuma clinical trials. And right here, you'll see on the video, a copy of this medical release authorization to release medical records. The next thing is informed consent. Okay. And, and oftentimes the medical authorization to release records is embedded into the informed consent. I cannot share an informed consent with you because those are proprietary with every sponsor. But And maybe we'll do a separate video just on informed consents in the future where I, I'm going to walk you through how to do it. But informed consent, nothing can get done 
technically not even that authorization to release medical records can get done without the informed consent. That's why for many sponsors, it's embedded into the informed consent form, the, the authorization to release medical records. Now, these informed consent forms, they range anywhere from 15 pages to, I have a one study, this particular study I'm looking at, 39 pages. You Generally, the more complex the study, the longer the informed consent form is. This is where you've got to make sure that you're following your SOP, your standard operating procedure at your site, because there's a lot, and we're going to get into this in the informed consent video, but you have to document your process of consent. So I don't care if it's paper consent or electronic consent, which we also use ourselves. We use both. You have to document the process of consent, and it's literally called process of consent. So generally, and again, you have to follow your SOP because if your SOP says the PI is involved or a sub I is involved, or your SOP might say PI or sub I is optional or PI or sub I may be, there's a difference between is and maybe with your SOPs. And again, this is going to overlap into another video we're going to do later on SOPs. But as far as informed consents are concerned, at the screening visit, it's the first thing you need to do. You need to make sure you're following your SOPs, and then you need to make sure you document your process of consent. Generally, your process of consent is patient was met in a private room. Opportunity for questions were asked. Patient was given a copy of the consent at the end. Patient was encouraged to discuss with their family members about the consent form, um, about the study. Patient understood that their participation is voluntary. Patient understood the safety and the risks and the benefits of the study and the study drug. You want to document all those things. It's not enough that you just obtain a signature on the consent form and that's it. You need to document that in your source, ideally as contemporaneously as you can, meaning we're going to do another video on ALCOAC, but one of the C's stands for contemporaneous, which means timely. So if you did your informed consent at 843, your progress note, especially if you're using eSource like we are, needs to be as close to 843 as possible when it comes to writing that process of consent. Meaning, if you're with the patient and you're doing the consent and they signed it, while they're signing it, you should be writing your process of consent. It's only a few sentences, but just get it in there, get it published, get it timestamped. If you're using paper source, you don't need to worry about timestamp, but the practice of being contemporaneous is still there. So, Provided there are no sub-studies, oftentimes trials have optional sub-studies where patients can opt in to another study or they can decline. you got to document that, whatever they chose. Then the very next thing you should do as soon as they sign the consent form, you need to go into the IRT, which is the uh, Investigation Response Technology. I believe that's what it stands for, but everyone calls it IRT. It's a system you log into that the sponsor gave you access to and training on, and you need to officially register the patient as screened. Now, in order to register them as screened, you may need their demographics, like their date of birth, their sex at birth, um, their ethnicity, Oftentimes, IRTs ask for different things, but it generally involves initials, date of birth, and then they will the, the system will give them a screening number. And the screening number is usually a combination of your site number. So every site for every study has a number, followed by, in order of screening, the patient number. So in this case, I'm looking at uh, patient 136, which is our site number, and 0001, which is the patient. It's the first patient that we screened. So the next thing, and when, when creating this source, you need to make sure that you're following the order of the protocol. So this is, this is assuming that your source was created properly. If you need help creating your source, my company can help you do that. 
for a low monthly fee. Not only will we help create your source for you, but we're going to get you studies. We're going to negotiate your contracts and we're going to do videos on all those topics later. But it's, it's a really good low cost month to month service that we have. One of them is creating your source. The next thing in my order on my screening visit is obtaining the medical history. So once I obtain the demographics, I obtain the medical history. This is important. This is really important and should not be overlooked. If you don't have the patient's medical records with you, you need to get a verbal report from them. So what we do for, for cases where we don't have the patient's medical history with us, we have a template form that we created that you can ask your patient to fill out or you can fill it out with them and say, hey, what, what's your medical history? Have you had any surgeries? Do you have any allergies to anything that you're aware of? What medications are you on? Those things are very important. Those are medical histories. The next section is con meds. So it's also related to medical history. What medications are you currently on? If they tell you a medication that they're on, you need to ask them what it's for. For example, in this case, baby aspirin. This patient's taking 81 milligrams of baby aspirin. That's a prophylaxis. We have the medical history on there as the reason is prophylaxis. They have another medication here. We ask them what it's for. Hey, it's for allergies. Okay, boom. Now we have another medical history. We have another one. What is this for? It's for heartburn. Okay, now we have heartburn as a medical history. We have another one. What's this for? It's osteopenia. Okay, boom. And on and on. As detailed as you can. Why? Because you need to capture this data because every protocol, and these protocols are getting more and more complex, have prohibited medications that patients cannot be taking while they're in the study. So at screening, you really need to focus on patient safety. Are the medications that the patient is currently taking, are they allowed to be on while in the study? The answer will not always be yes. So now you have to have a conversation with the patient. Well, hey, this medication for your blood pressure it's actually prohibited for you to be in the study. So if you want to be in it, you have to agree to wash off. They will allow this medication. And this is where a clinician, ideally your PI or your sub-I, and the patient will have a conversation. But you as a study coordinator can have this conversation too based on the advice from the PI or a clinician and the patient. Say, hey, you know what? Are you willing to wash off uh, of this medication? We have a 30-day screening window. Some studies, it's 45 days. Some studies, it's 14 days. Every study is different where you have to come off of certain medications before you can be randomized. Because remember, at screening, generally, you're not giving study drug yet. You're just seeing if the patient qualifies. And you have a few days, a few weeks, sometimes a month and a half in order to get the patient from screening to randomization which will be another video we'll do, the Comprehensive Guide to Randomization. Screening and randomization visits are very similar. The only difference is that randomization, you're actually giving them the study drug. At screening, you're prepping them to be able to be qualified for the study drug. So this is where a lot of patients say, even after they sign the consent, they say, hey, you know what? I wasn't aware that I would have to come off of gabapentin. Um let me think about it. So you've already screened the patient. Now you can let them go home and think about it. Or you can ask them, hey, do you want to finish this visit and then think about it? You still have time until randomization. So oftentimes they'll say, yes, we, let's, just finish, let's just finish the screening visit. Other times they'll say, yeah, that's okay. I'm not even really taking that as I should be. And my doctor was thinking about taking me off of that anyways. Other times, the PI is the patient's doctor, and the PI will say, that's fine, they're going to come off of this, and the patient usually agrees. So again, every site's different, every situation's different, but this con med and this medical history, probably the most critical thing that needs to be documented, mainly from a patient safety standpoint, but also from a data integrity standpoint. 
the last thing you want to do is randomize somebody while they're taking an, a prohibited medication or while they have a medical condition that is unstable or that is also prohibited from being in the study. Um, the next thing in this particular visit was a pain scale because this is a pain study, but you might have your own study specific assessments here. The reason this pain scale is here next in this order is because the patient can screen fail right here because in my case, this is a pain study. If the patient doesn't score high enough on their pain surveys, which we will be giving them in, at this order in this particular study, they could screen fail right here. If they screen fail right here because they don't meet their threshold of pain for the protocol, we shouldn't continue the visit. This would be a screen failure. If they do score according to what the protocol allows, you continue. So this is why the order of assessments is important at screening because you don't want to waste your time and do all this unnecessary stuff when you could have screen failed the patient for an assessment early in the study, right? The next thing in this particular study would be physical exam. So this typically you need a clinician to do it. Uh, could be a nurse, could be a physician assistant, could be a PI, could be a sub-I, whatever the PI delegates. Was In this case, it was our sub-I doing it. What uh, Physical exam. So everything, general appearance, comprehensive skin exam, head, eyes, ears, nose, throat, heart, lungs, musculoskeletal, neurological, lymph nodes, abdomens, extremities, knees, other. In this case, other was not done, but we have other. There should be notes here as well. There should be actual notes. In this case, I'll read you what our sub I wrote. Patient was here today for screening visit. Subject alert and oriented times four. Study protocol explained in detail. This is where the sub I is doing good. He wrote a process of consent as well. Patient signed informed consent. Visit conducted per protocol. Physical assessment conducted. Reports that one year history of pain. Uh, diagnosed with this particular condition. Um, and then it goes on to describe like the physical exam, the conditions that they discovered. The next thing is vital signs. So height, weight, temperature. All these things are also time stamped. And if you're not using e-source, you're using paper, you should still document the time. What time was the informed consent done? What time was the medical history obtained? What time were the con meds obtained? What time was, was the assessment done? What time was the physical exam done? What time was the vitals done? What time was the temperature done? What time, what method of temperature was there? Respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure. And every study might ask you to collect different things, but th these are standard vital signs. It would be good to have a little note here too as to who did it, or if you're using paper source, very important to document the A in ALCOAC, attributable, who did it. If you're using eSource, it does it for you because it shows you who did it and at what time automatically. If you're using paper source, you got to make sure that person signs and dates and writes the time of when they did the vitals. The next thing in this study is ECG. And again, who did it, what time, time of position, time of the ECG reading, name of the person performing the ECG, and then they ask particular things about the ECG results. Ventricular rate, PR interval, QRS interval, QT interval. Um, what did the investigator think about the ECG? Was it normal, abnormal? If abnormal, which most of them are because these machines are very finicky, was it not clinically significant or clinically significant? In this case, it was abnormal, but not clinically significant, which is probably the most common finding for ECGs. The note from the clinician said patient asymptomatic. So that's that. PI or sub by has to sign and date this ECG. Very important. Sign and date and put assessment of clinically significant or not clinically significant. The next thing at this screening visit is the blood test. So this is where, again, you document 
you get the associated lab kit with your visit. Every visit and every study has a lab kit for that visit. So in this case, it will be visit one screening. You grab that kit, whoever is going to draw the blood, please make sure they're trained on the lab manual. There's, it's important to draw the tubes in the right order. It's important to process the tubes with the centrifuge or not with the centrifuge and to ship the tubes ambient, refrigerated, frozen, as per the lab manual, every study is different, varies wildly. This particular study has like 10 tubes to draw at screening. It's crazy, and each tube has to be treated a different way. Like, make sure you know the lab manual. In this particular screening visit, the blood draw is actually the hardest part, knowing which tubes to draw. And that, because there, in, in this study, there's like multiple kits for visit one. In most studies, there's just one kit. In this study, there's multiple kits for visit one, and each tube, again, has a different process. Some are centrifuge, some are not. Some are frozen, some are ambient, some are refrigerated. You have to document it all. You have to do it all the, the right way. You have to fill out the requisition form properly in the kit. Every kit comes with a requisition form, uh, which is an actual paper that you fill out. A lot of these studies now also have in the IRT system I mentioned, very similar to that system is a lab portal where you will do maybe digital requisition or maybe paper requisition. So this is where the variability of the studies comes into play. But again, who drew the blood, what time, those are the basic things. Who processed the blood? Make sure the people that process the blood, meaning ship the blood, are IATA certified. Um, you can get IATA certified for free online if you Google it. Next thing is the urine. Was the urine collected? What test do you need to do? Do you, do you, need, do you need to do a dipstick test for urine drug screen or for urinalysis? Do you need to do a pregnancy test? Or do you ship the urine to the central lab? Every study is different. Every study will have slightly different way to do these things. But make sure you know the right way for your study at every visit and make sure again it's documented and it follows ALCOAC standards, attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, accurate, and complete. The next assessment in this particular study was obtaining an x-ray. Now, this study is complicated. We have an x-ray, an eye exam, and an MRI in addition to all the other stuff I just mentioned. It's not reasonable to get all those things done on screening day, all on the same day. So they give us a 30-day window to get all this stuff done. We don't even, we can schedule an x-ray because those are relatively quick. It's like about 10 minutes and our vendor will take our patient sometime same day and sometimes no appointment needed, just walk in. Your vendor might be different. You might need to figure out logistics. For our eye exam and our MRI, we do need appointments. And those are longer visits. Those are about 30 to 60 minutes. So it makes no sense to send a patient to do a long assessment like that if they're going to screen fail based on the labs or if they're going to screen fail based on something else. So you want to save these things till your lab results come back. Oftentimes you won't get the lab results we just talked about you're not going to get the lab results back for a few days. So you're not going to know if the patient qualifies or not until a few days. If your site uses a local lab, sometimes you can get the results same day. In either case, it still doesn't make sense to do these MRIs or eye exams or other long assessments like that because they, they just take up too much time. So you can spread it out. You have a screening window, use it. Give your patient flexibility. Give them options. Remember, you want to give the patient a good experience. Most likely, this is their first time doing a study. This is their first experience. You don't want to make it difficult for them, more difficult than it should be. So treat them well throughout this whole thing. I should have probably prefaced this at the beginning. You want to give your patient a good experience. So all this stuff that you got to do, the patient can't know that it's stressful for you. 
You know, you have to make it, if that means having an assistant, if that means having people just dedicated to making sure the patient's okay. One of the things we do for our patients, most of the time these blood tests require fasting. One of the things we do for our patients is we have someone get them a snack after we draw the blood if they want it. Then we offer them coffee, we offer them water, food, all those things. Screening visits typically take two to four hours, depending on the complexity of the study. And that's without the additional assessments that your study may ask for that take longer. Uh, and then you document any adverse events, because as soon as the patient signs that consent form, you start tracking adverse events, meaning any untoward medical occurrence. So let's say you drew the blood and the patient got dizzy or got nauseous. You should document that as an adverse event because they already signed the consent form. It's obviously not due to the study drug because they're not taking the study drug yet, but it is an adverse event. Good documentation practices will say that you should document that as an adverse event. Then the visit's basically over. This is probably what I just went through. It's like a two-hour process. Um, if you include half an hour for the consent, half an hour for the blood, half an hour for the EKGs and vitals, it easily adds up to two hours. Talking a little bit. I always like to make the patient feel comfortable so we have like personal conversations that are nothing to do with their visit. But hey, tell me a little bit about your family. Or sometimes they'll just bring up. Some patients are more talkative than others. And if they feel, if you feel like they like to talk, then that's what makes them feel comfortable, engage. Some patients are more reserved. They don't want to talk. And that's okay, too. Just respect the patient however they present themselves. Make sure you document everything. Make sure if you have any questions, ask your CRA, hey, we just did a screening visit. Um, did we do it right? Make sure your PI writes a progress note. Okay, every visit, but especially screening, make sure your PI writes a progress note. Make sure your PI signs the informed consent form. Even if there's not a place on the informed consent form for PI, if it's in your SOP that the PI needs to review the informed consent, make sure they sign it as well, sign and date it ideally the same day. Um, if they're gonna, if they're not available that day, make sure the first day that they're back that they can review the informed consent form. That progress note is super important. If your PI can't do the progress note, make sure your sub I can do it. But make sure your PI has oversight. As soon as you get the lab results back, PI should sign and date those labs and assess those labs when they come back within two to three days for clinical significance or of any abnormalities. PI needs to sign and date it. Same thing with the ECG. You, the ECG you'll get back right away because the machine prints it off. Now, if your PI is not there, your clinician, your sub I or some clinician can sign and date, ideally that day. But the PI, because he or she is the principal investigator and has overall responsibility of the study and of patient safety, needs to sign and date and have what's called a PI footprint on the study. So make sure you document, make sure you get all the assessments done, make sure you follow the screening window, make sure you utilize as many days as you need to from the screening window, make sure if the patients are washing off of any prohibited meds that you know exactly the washout schedule for that particular drug. This is where the protocols get tricky. Some medications they have to stop at screening right away, other medications they have to wash off. Other medications they actually could not be on sometimes six months prior to even screening. So that's a screen fail right there, and you should catch it. That's a screening visit in a nutshell. At the end, you pay the patient for their time based on what the informed consent says and what the budget allows. And you make sure the patient has a good experience. You make sure you communicate with them, hey, this is the next step. This is what we're going to do. We're waiting on your lab results. Be in constant communication with your patient and then get ready to randomize the patient. Hopefully this helps. Thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Bye-bye.